It's been a while since I've done one of these. Believe it or not, I've been getting some requests. People actually want to hear me read feminist stories. So today we have Cooking Lessons by Rosario Castellanos from Mexico. This was written in 1972. The kitchen is shining white. It's a shame to have to get it dirty. One ought to sit down and contemplate it, describe it, close one's eyes, evoke it. Looking closely, this spotless, this perchitude lacks the glaring excess that causes chills in hospitals. Or is it the halo of disinfectants, the rubber cushioned steps of AIDS, the hidden presence of sickness and death? What do I care? My place is here. I've been here from the beginning of time. In the German proverb, women is, is synonymous with Kuch, Kinder, Kirch. That's Kuch is church, Kinder is children, like kindergarten, and Kirch is kitchen, cooking. I wandered astray through classrooms, streets, offices, cafes, wasting my time on skills that now I must forget in order to acquire others. For example, choosing the menu. How could one carry out such an arduous task without the cooperation of society, of all history? On a special shelf, just right from my height, my guardian spirits are lined up. Those acclaimed jugglers the rec that reconcile the most irreducible contradictions among the pages of their recipe books, slimness and gluttony, pleasing appearance and economy, speed and succulence. With their infinite combinations, slimness and economy, speed and pleasing appearance, succulence and... What can you suggest to me for today's meal? Oh, experience, housewife, inspiration of mothers here and gone, voice of tradition, clamoring sequin of the supermarkets. I open a book at random and read Don Quixote's Dinner. Very literally, but not very satisfying, because Don Quixote was not famous as a gourmet, but as a bumbler. Although a more profound analysis of the text reveals etc, etc, ugh, more ink has flowed about that character than water under bridges. Foul center face. Esoteric. Whose face? Does the face of someone or something have a center? If it does, it must not be very appetizing. Bigos Romanian. Well, just who do you think you're talking to? If I knew what Tarragon or Ananas were, I wouldn't be consulting this book, because I know a lot of other things, too. If you had the slightest sense of reality, you yourself or any of your colleagues would take the trouble to write a dictionary of technical terms, edit a few proglogamena, invent a propodatic to make the, difficulty culinary, the difficult culinary act accessible to the layperson. But you all start from the assumption that we're all in, we're all in on the secret, and you limit yourself to starting it. I, at least, solemnly declare that I am not, and never have been, in on either this or any other secret you share. I never understand anything about anything. You observe the symptoms. I stand here like an imbecile, an, imbe an impeccable and neutral kitchen, wearing the apron that I usurp in order to give a pretense of efficiency, and of which I shall be shamefully but justly stripped. I open the refrigerator drawer that proclaims meat. I extract a package that I cannot recognize under its icy coating. I thaw it in hot water, revealing the title without which I would never have identified the contents. Fancy beef broil. Wonderful. A plain and wholesome dish. But since it doesn't mean resolving an autonomy or proposing an axiom, it doesn't appeal to me. Moreover, it's more simply... It's not simply an excess of logic that inhibits my hunger. It's also the appearance of it. Frozen stiff. It's the color that shows now that I've been ripped open the package. Red, as if it were just about to start bleeding. Our backs were that same color, husband and I, after our orgiastic sunbathing on the beaches of Acapulco. He could afford the luxury of behaving like the man he is, and stretch out face down to avoid rubbing his painful skin. But I, self-sacrificing little Mexican wife, born like a dove to the nest, smiled like Cahutamak under torture on the rack when he said, My bed is not made of roses, and fell silent. Face up, I bore not only my own weight, but also his on top of me. 
the classic position for making love. And I moaned for the tearing and the pleasure, the classic moan, miss, miss. It's this position, it's the boring old standard missionary kind of thing. That's what I'm going to have to do in Mexico. The best part, for my sunburn at least, was when he fell asleep. Under my fingertips, not very sensitive due to prolonged contact with typewriter keys, the nylon of my bridal nightgown slipped away in a fraudulent attempt to look like lace. I played with the tips of the buttons and those other ornaments that make whoever wears them seem so feminine in the late night darkness. The whiteness of my clothes, deliberate, repetitive, immodestly a symbolic, was temporarily abolished. Perhaps at some moment it managed to accomplish its purpose beneath the light and the glance of those eyes that are now overcome by fatigue. Eyelids close, and behold, once again, exile, an enormously sandy expanse with no juncture other than the sea, whose movement suggests paralysis, with no invitation except that of the cliff to suicide. But that's a lie. I'm not the dream that dreams in a dream that dreams. I'm not the reflection of an image in a glass. I'm not annihilated by the closing off of a consciousness or of all possible consciousness. I go on living a dense, vicious, turbid life, even though the man at my side and the one far away ignore me, forget me, postpone me, abandon me, fall out of love with me. I, too, am a consciousness that can close itself off, abandon someone, and expose him to annihilation. I, the meat under the sprinkling of the salt, has toned down some of its offensive redness, and now it seems more tolerable, more familiar to me. It's that piece I used a thousand times without realizing it when I used to pop in to tell the cook that we weren't born together, our meeting was due to accident, a happy one, it's still too soon to say. We met by chance at an exhibition, a lecture, a film. We ran into each other in the elevator. He gave me his seat on the tram. A guard interrupted our perplexed and parallel contemplation of the giraffe because it was time to close the zoo. Someone, he or I, it's all the same, asked the stupid question, but indispensable question. Do you work or study? A harmony of interests and of good intentions, a show of serious intentions. A year ago, I hadn't the slightest idea of his existence, and now I'm lying close to him with our thighs entwined, damp with the sweat and semen. I could get up without waking him, walk barefoot to the shower. To purify myself? I feel no revulsion. I prefer to believe what links him to me is something as easy to wipe away as a secretion, and not as terrible as a sacrament. So I remain still, breathing rhythmically to imitate drowsiness, my insomnia, the only spinster's jewel I've kept and I'm inclined to keep until death. Beneath the brief deluge of pepper, the meat seems to have gone gray. I banish the sign of aging by rubbing it as though I were trying to penetrate the surface and impregnate its thickness with flavors. Because I lost my old name and I still can't get used to the new one, which is not mine either.